Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. My name's Luke McLean. I'm Zali's Policy Director. Um, and thanks for joining us here tonight for the 75 by 35 Climate Change Forum. Before I welcome Zali and the rest of the panelists to stage, just a few housekeeping announcements. Um, if you could all please turn your phones off or put them on silent, that'd be appreciated so we don't interrupt the panel. Um, for emergency exits, you've got the green signs at the top and the bottom of the hall, um, and then the bathrooms are outside to the left at the top of the balcony there. Um, just so you're all aware, tonight's event will be recorded and will be uploaded online afterwards, and we'll have captions on there for any um, one who needs that service. Um, tonight, firstly, we'll hear an introduction from Zali, then we'll hear a brief statement from each of our panellists, and then we'll proceed to a question and answer session, um, some of which will be drawn from the questions that you kindly submitted online before the session, and then we'll have more of an open forum after that time permitting. Um, if we don't get to your question by the end of the evening, um, we'll be around for a little while after the event. Um, and feel free to come up and ask us any questions afterwards. Right now, though, thank you, and I'll pass over to the member for Ringer, Zali Stegel. Thank you and hello everyone. It's exciting to be back here talking about climate policy, where we're at, where we need to get to and how we're going to get there. Uh, if I could start by uh, acknowledging uh, traditional owners of the land on which we meet, uh, past, present and emerging and acknowledging their incredible custodianship of this land, earth and sea and how they tread much lighter on it than we have. Um, and the incredible opportunity we have this year to make such acknowledgements of country even more meaningful by making it permanent in our constitution and giving them a voice. And for those that were not maybe able to attend our voice forum, I invite you to check out the recording on social media, on our socials and on the website about it to answer questions and address it. Um, but this is exciting. Now, when I came to politics and uh, very ser uh, serendipitously, today is actually the fourth uh, anniversary of uh, the election in 2019. Uh, and I certainly thought when I realised, it was actually not done on purpose, but when I realised that this morning, I thought how incredibly fitting and appropriate that we be here uh, to talk about what that next step is that we need to, to do when it comes to climate policy and how can we continue to be climate champions. That was the pledge I made to you in 2019 and that I continue to make and um, am very, very committed. So we have an incredible panel of experts here tonight. Um, Leslie Hughes, who will speak uh, shortly, Tim Buckley, Anna Freeman and Sol Griffith. Many of these incredible experts you've seen on the news at various times and so it's very generous of them to come and give us their insight into where policy is at, where science is at and where our opportunities are. Now tonight I'm also launching the new, uh, officially launching the new campaign to call on the government to commit to a floor commitment of 75 by 35, so 75 per cent emission reduction by 2035. <laughs> and that relies on you. So for that, we need to build a public pressure, a campaign to put pressure on the government to commit to that minimum floor by 2035. It will be the, for it to be our next NDC under the Paris Agreement. We know latest IPCC report shown human-induced climate change causing dangerous and widespread disruption. You only have to turn on the news to see the events happening in Italy at the moment, to know the events that happened in Australia over the last few years, from bushfires to floods, that these events are accelerating. And unfortunately today, we woke up to the new, and I know Leslie will talk some more about it, that uh, there is now strong data to indicate that we will cross the one5 uh, degree uh, of warming threshold uh, as soon as 2027. So there really is no time to waste. We need rapid, deep cuts in greenhouse uh, emissions. Governments around the world are responding, some with quite uh, landmark policies, and we'll hear from the panel about those. Uh, countries like the USA um, passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is doing amazing things to accelerate transition. 
In Australia, we're still a little stuck from a government point of view on policy. We're stuck with what the promises were for the election in 2022. And that was driven more by political fear than by scientific sort of uh, expediency and what actually needs to be done. So we have to be the vocal opposition. We know the op current government opposition, uh, the coalition, won't be pushing the Labor government to be more ambitious. But that comes back to the crossbench independents and communities to do that work. I have a very strong belief that we can go from laggards to leaders when it comes to climate policy. And for that, we just need to put in the right kind of pressure. We need to make sure business, social uh, uh, communities, non-for-profits, everyone, industry all get behind and understand what our potential is, what is a realistic target and where we absolutely can go. So tonight we're going to discuss where climate policy needs to go from a point of science, finance and innovation. All those perspectives come together to enable a successful transition and, and are so important. So we're going to start uh, with a short presentation from each of our panellists. And as Luke said, then we'll get to some questions and then hopefully more questions from the floor. Um, I'll start with uh, Professor Leslie Hughes. So Leslie Hughes is going to discuss the latest IPCC report and the news that we had today around warming. She's a Professor Emeritus uh, in Biology and the Pro-Chancellor of Macquarie University. Her principal research interests have been the impacts on climate change on species and ecosystems and the implications for conservation. She's a former lead, lead author of the IPCC's fourth and fifth assessment report. She's a former federal climate commissioner, a member of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists, a councillor the, with the Biodiversity Council of Australia, a director of the Environmental Defenders Office, and a councillor and director of the Climate Council of Australia. And she has recently, thankfully, been appointed as a member of the Climate Change Authority that is doing much of the work advising the government. So we're very lucky to have her. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you, Zali, and thank you, everybody, for coming out on this cold night. Um, in the interests of time, I'm only going to show, which is very unusual for me, um, only one slide. Um, but then I'll talk a little bit more after that because um, I want to get through it quickly. And some of you may have seen me um, actually present this slide before. It, it'll be a little animation. What this will show is every country in the world, they're arranged alphabetically, so Australia's just about halfway along that front top row. It'll take us through from 1880 to 2021, and um, the blue circles around the country will be the cooler than average years um, over that period for that country. The orange and red circles will be the warmer than average years. For quite a long time, nothing much is going to happen. And so if you'll excuse the pun, it will take a little while to warm up. But when we get to about the mid-80s through to pretty much where we are now, it'll be pretty obvious what's going on. So let's get going. So there we are. It doesn't really matter where you are in the world, that's what's going on. Okay, Zali asked me to um, really talk a little bit about the last IPC assessment re report um, and I'll add to it a little bit about the report that was released last night. So the IPCC is basically the UN sponsored body that about every seven years produces a massive assessment of everything we know about climate change to that point that's been published in the last few years. The last assessment um, has three million words in it, um, and I'm gonna try and boil those three million words down to eight key messages that I think are the key ones. The first one is that the IPCC uses the word unequivocal. It's a very deliberate use of that word, and they say it is absolutely unequivocal that human activities are warming the planet and changing the climate. 
We now have about 50% more CO2 in the atmosphere than we did in the Industrial Revolution. It's probably the highest level for at least two million years that we know about. And most importantly, the rate of increase of CO2 over the past 20 years is 100 times the rate of the entire period going back to the last ice age. Emissions continue to grow. There was a little blip during the GFC and another little blip during the height of the COVID pandemic, around about a 5% drop. But once we came out of the pandemic, the emissions kept growing. About 90% of the emissions come from coal, oil, gas, and cement production. Now, methane, you know that book, We Need to Talk About Kevin? Well, we need to talk about methane. We don't talk nearly enough about methane, but um, as Ali and I were talking before, there'll be a lot more talk about methane very soon. Molecule for molecule, methane is a far more effective greenhouse gas than CO2. If I released a molecule of methane right now and a molecule of CO2, the methane is a better by 120 times the heat trapping capacity of that molecule of CO2. Over the first 20 years, it's about 80 times more effective. Over 100 years, it's 20 times more effective. Methane eventually breaks down to CO2 and then, of course, does what CO2 does. Methane has gone up over 150% since the Industrial Revolution. About 60% of it comes from human activities. So things like livestock, every cow produces about 500 litres of methane every single day. Think about that when you're getting your next steak. Um, other sources are from the mining of fossil fuels, including fugitive emissions. Okay, so. The impact of all of this, including what I just showed you on that animation, uh, the impacts are being felt by everything, everywhere. The oceans are absorbing about 90% of that excess heat in the system, fortunately for us on land, but that means we can now detect warming down to a depth of two kilometres. The oceans are also absorbing um, probably 40 to 50% of the extra CO2 in the atmosphere, also doing us a favour, but that is making the oceans more acidic, which is very bad news for marine life. And the rate of sea level rise has doubled since um, a couple of decades ago. It's going up for two reasons. One is that there's just a lot more fresh water going in because the glaciers and the ice caps are melting very quickly. The other reason is that warm water is less dense than cold water, so warm water simply occupies more volume. So about 50% of that increase is simply due to the, warm, uh, the warming oceans. Now, the way we feel the impacts of climate change is not due to averages at all. The average is just a, a, a shorthand way of talking about things. We feel it through the increasing severity of um, and frequency of extreme events, things like bushfires, droughts, floods, storms, etc. By 2022, so by the end of last year, the world had warmed 1.15 degrees. By the end of 2019, Australia has actually warmed 1.47 degrees. So we're already very close to that 1.5. The World Meteorological Organization put out a report last night that indicated that in the next five years, we have a two thirds chance of at least one of those years being over 1.5 for the globe. It might be a temporary blip, um, but it's nonetheless very, very concerning. There is a 98% chance that um, one of the next five years will once again break the warmest year on record, uh, record. The last eight years have been the eight warmest on record, as you saw from that animation. Our water cycle is intensifying, dry areas are getting drier, wet areas are getting wetter. When it does rain, it comes down in more intense bursts, and that's because a warmer atmosphere holds more water, it's holding more energy, so that we get a lot more rain. Here in Australia, our bushfire seasons are now about two months longer than they used to be. The black summer bushfires started in winter um, and burnt an area three times the size of Tasmania. So the IPCC says we are approaching some irreversible tipping points in the Earth system. We don't know where most of those tipping points are. Think of it like this. Think of you driving in a car towards a cliff in a fog. You know you're going to get to the edge of that cliff somewhere and that's your tipping point. It would be a really good idea to um, put the brakes on right now. 
We are adapting, of course, and the human species is an enormously adaptive um, animal, um, but there are hard limits. The myth of endless, endless adaptation is a myth. And I will just use one word to illustrate that, Lismore. You'll think back to Lismore that had 14.7 increase of river height through the middle of the town. Lismore's in one of the wealthiest states in the, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, yet there were people on their roofs waiting to be rescued for 24 hours. It was an absolutely perfect example of uh, climate change overwhelming the, the governance and the institutional systems that we think will keep us safe because they did not keep the people of Lismore safe. Climate change is also, it's not just an environmental problem, of course, it's a health problem, it's um, an economic problem, it's a food security problem, and it's a problem of social justice because it's, it's disproportionately affecting those in society and those in countries around the world that have done the least to cause the problem uh, but are the most vulnerable to its impacts. Oxfam published a report a couple of years ago indicating that 20 million people every year are now displaced by climate-related events. So that's all pretty depressing, I realise. Um, Tim's here to give some good news. It's good that he always goes after me at these sorts of events. But there is one little silver lining in the IPCC report, which is mostly pretty gloomy, I have to say, and that is that there is still a window of opportunity for a safer climate. That window is closing very rapidly. We are heading for closure. Um, and the IPCC, though, makes it fairly clear um, that it hasn't closed completely and there are still a lot of things we have to do. If the Paris pledges are met 100% and on time, we get to 2.8 degrees. If the Glasgow pledges are met 100% and on time, we still get to 2.4 degrees. That's twice the amount of warming that we've already had. That is still a very, very dangerous planet. So we know that global emissions have to be halved by 2030 at the very latest to have a chance of that. And aiming for net zero by 2050, we know now is at least a decade too late. Hence the timeliness of the uh, campaign that um, we're celebrating here tonight. We also know, of course, that any new fossil fuel development is completely incompatible with meeting any of these targets. And with that, I will leave it there and pass over to Zali again. Thank you very much. OK. But we are going to hear now about how, where our window of hope is, that we can do this. And talking, um, but thank you, Leslie, for just that incredible reminder of why we are here and why we care and why it is so important that uh, we not let our voices dim because we actually need to get louder. We need to accelerate that ambition. And there are other means to do that. So uh, next, we're going to hear from Tim Buckley. Tim has 30 years financial markets experience, including providing public interest related financial analysis on the energy transition since 2018, studying China, India and Australia. Now we know naysayers always bring up China and India, and so it's really important to understand where those big nations are, what their contribution is as well. Tim founded the Climate Energy Finance Australia at the start of 2022, having co-founded and worked with the global energy finance think tank, AIFA, from 2013 to 2021. Tim was co-founder of a startup global listed clean energy equities fund with Westpac as a cornerstone investor. And from 1998 to 2007, Tim was the managing director at Citigroup, head of Austral Australasian equity research. He's published over 100 reports on global energy transition. I was lucky enough to have Tim come and speak at our first climate forum back in 2019. There's been great developments um, and it's really exciting to hear from Tim. Thank you, Zali, and good evening, everyone. The science is absolutely clear, and I, I really don't want to listen to Leslie too often because we <laughs> could get too depressed, but it's critically important. I accept the science, I put it aside, and we've got to act on the um, opportunity. And so I think Zali's opening comment that 
we need to move from being a laggard to a leader is absolutely spot on. And uh, I think that applies very much to America and that is happening right now. And that is also the opportunity for Australia. So I will just take you through a lot more slides than Leslie had. Um, I'll do it very quickly, um, but obviously we've got time for questions. So I will start by talking about China just for a minute, and uh, then I'll talk about the IRA, the, Re the Inflation Reduction Act, the US Inflation Reduction Act, the global response we're seeing, and then I'll just end on one or two comments about Australia. Um, firstly, the China, then the international response. Uh, China, to me, I'll, I'll start there, even though the, the main point I want to make is about the US Inflation Reduction Act. It's worth bearing in mind, China is probably a decade ahead of the West, ahead of America. And China is the red. You don't have to know what the, what the individual bars are. It's all the processing of every critical mineral that we need, or most of the critical minerals. And China is the dominant player. Um, they are absolutely dominant in solar, in hydro, in nuclear, in wind, in grid, in energy efficiency, in hydrogen, you name it, they, electric vehicles, batteries, every one of those, they dominate the world. Now, that is the core of why America is responding, so it's great, we've now got an investment technology race. But just to, uh, again, don't worry about all the numbers, I'm a numbers person, but this is the data from the last, the first three months of 2023. So China installed 50 gigawatts of wind and solar in the first three months of this year. An annualised run rate of 200 gigawatts, that's about three times as much as the national electricity market of Australia. So any suggestion that they are the world's laggard is really the wrong framing. It's half the story that they are the biggest producer consumer and um, burner of coal in the world, but they are by far the number one investor in wind and solar. 84% of all of their new capacity ads in the last three months were wind and solar. So I'll, I think that's the core. At the end of the day, America has responded because of the geopolitical threat that China was absolutely winning this investment and technology race. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, I think, is a total game changer and it really has shifted in an unbelievably short time frame um, America from being a total laggard to a potential leader. And uh, you can see when we look at the investor queue for wind, solar, battery, new generation capacity in America, it's 1,450 1, gigawatts of capacity is queued up. Investors are trying to build that to get it connected to the grid. And you can see that almost all of it solar and storage and wind, a little bit of gas, um, no coal, and very little nuclear. So that's America, the home of nuclear, and they're going wind and solar as fast as they possibly can. The other thing about the Inflation Reduction Act is it's really galvanising a massive build out of the supply chains that we need at the scale we need to actually build uh, the infrastructure of, um, of the zero emissions market and so we'll definitely talk more about that I'm sure. But it's been staggering watching the number of announcements of billion dollar plus, five billion dollar plus type investments in manufacturing in America. And so, that, hence my comment, it is a massive threat to Australia as well as a massive opportunity. So I'll come back to that, but America, um, like, uh, the biggest hydrogen electrolyzer factory in the world was commissioned a couple of months ago. It's one gigawatt. Uh, it was commissioned by Nell Hydro of Norway. They've just announced they're building a four gigawatt factory in America. Every week we're seeing gigawatt multi tens of gigawatt hour battery factories being built five billion dollars six billion dollar battery factories by the koreans and by the japanese and by the americans themselves uh, so there's been a huge resurgence in manufacturing a huge resurgence in employment on the back of that and it's crowding in a lot of investment and we did see a bit of that in the budget here in australia uh, you saw the two billion dollar green hydrogen Head Start program, that's a direct response to the IRA because Woodside and Fortescue and everyone else wanting to get subsidies from the Australian government saying we just won't build the factories here, we'll build them in America and it was happening real time. But the US Inflation Reduction Act has galvanised a response in Europe with the Net, Ind Net Zero Industries Act. 
um, Europe's responding. They first started bitching about what America was doing, saying it's unfair, it's, it's anti-free trade, and then they said, oh, we're, we're not going to win that one, so let's actually just do the same thing. Uh, India, they've got their PLI scheme, so they're proposing to build 70 gigawatts of solar module manufacturing capacity in competition to China. Japan, they've announced the GX roadmap, again, a $200 billion reindustrialization of Japan, the, the promise of a uh, emissions trading scheme, a carbon price by 2026. Canada, a critical minerals competitor to Australia, they've announced their Canadian critical minerals strategy. Korea, uh, probably the biggest investment, they've announced a multi $200, $400 billion stimulus, $30 billion of that going into batteries, and most of those battery factories are being built in America, but for the factories being built in Korea, they're at the moment reliant on Chinese refining of Australian critical minerals. The IRA doesn't allow that. So all of a sudden, China's loss becomes our gain. Korea has to partner with Australia. So it's up to us and the Australian government to negotiate that we actually get a fair share of the value add in our country. Um, I'll just finish with two slides. One is the um, this one, which... Um, Nothing to do with the global, but it's about the response. This came out the same day as the budget, and so most people were focused on the. I got really excited by Western Australia's new energy plan. Now, why? It, don't worry about this. The, just no green, obviously wind, solar, and storage, and the scale of of ambition that this Western Australian government's announced. So, uh, 50 gigawatts of wind, solar, and batteries, but. Remember, Western Australia is the biggest state in the world in terms of LNG exports. So this is the gas state of the world, and it's just announced a massive industrialisation of heavy industry. They've actually been listening to us all. Maybe they've listened to Leslie on the science. So I think it's more the opportunity, the massive, massive industrial opportunity. So for the Western Australian government to be announcing a 50 gigawatts of wind, solar and battery storage, I find that... Uh, Really, it shows the order of magnitude of the change required, but also the fact that they're starting to do it and it becomes a race. And so ultimately, climate energy finance is calling for the federal government to invest $100 billion of our taxpayer money in patient, public, national interest-oriented capital allocations to everything to do with decarbonisation and manufacturing. So far, the budget, Jim Chalmers has announced $40 billion collectively, whether it's the National Reconstruction Fund or the Rewiring Australia um, or the Powering the Regions Fund, $40 billion. We probably need to do two or three or four times that and then galvanise private capital. We've got one of the biggest capital pools in the world, our superannuation. I, everyone and I talk to, to the trustees and the directors of all those super funds. They want to invest, but they need to have it de-risked. And that's where the federal government's got to take, in my view, a very strong leadership position. So Australia will be a value-added critical mineral superpower. It's a massive opportunity. And uh, Australia, if you think about it, we are one of well, we are the number one exporter of iron ore, LNG, coke and coal, number two in um, thermal coal, number one in the world in lithium. We play at world scale as a nation. We might only be 25 million people, but we play at world scale. So. That's the magnitude of opportunity for Australia. It's in the hundreds of billions, if not trillions. So I think we need to think brave and be a leader, not a laggard. Thank you. Thank you. So when you listen to that, you start to feel we've actually, we know where the brakes are if we're heading into the fog over that cliff. Um, and we actually do know where the brakes are. And we know that we've got a way of supercharging those brakes. We know we just need the levers, and that lever has to come from the government, and that, again, comes from all of us, uh, putting the right pressure. So next we're going to hear from Anna Freeman. Uh, she's a Policy D Director, Decarbonisation at the Clean Energy Council, and that's Australia's peak body uh, for the renewable energy sector, which represents more than 1,000 member organisations, and they're working across solar, wind, hydro, energy storage and green hydrogen in Australia. So when we see that big picture from Tim about what other countries are doing, and I can talk very much to what's happening in Australia, where, how we can go. Uh, she leads the, C C uh, the Clean Energy Council's policy and industry development work relating to the decarbonisation of the Australian economy and uh, the country's aspiration uh, to become a renewable energy superpower. Um, she's been 
in deeply engaged with energy and climate change policy for close to 20 years, working as public affairs director for two national climate change reviews on behalf of Australian state governments, the Ghana Review in 2008 and 2011, and was an advisor to the country's climate change authority. Anna also came and spoke to us in 2019. And so it's exciting to be able to see where have we progressed, where haven't we? Welcome, Anna. Hello, folks. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, yes, 2019 has very fond memories and it really feels like a very important um, moment. I just wanted to start by um, just tipping my hat, well, first of all, to all that Zali has done in Parliament since she got there four years ago. She's, she's begun a revolution in the Parliament and um, we need more of that over time. Um, as Zali mentioned, we're the peak body for the renewable energy sector in Australia. I just wanted to say I joined this organisation in 2017, um, fresh after having worked in the Ghana Climate Change Reviews and then for the Bushfires Royal Commission after the Black Saturday's bushfires. And I had had it up to here with impacts. I was having nightmares about polar bears. Um, um, and so I also wanted to tip my hat to Leslie to say it takes a lot for somebody to be a communicator of the science and stand up day after day and talk about um, what we need to face up to. Um, so I just really wanted to thank you for what you do. <laughs> this is Australia's energy policy history. <laughs> More changes in energy policies than Prime Ministers in the last decade, and we are so relieved that that is all behind us. Um, we've had um, some great... Um, uh, we've got a, a parliament that is much more supportive of climate action now, but also of the clean energy transition. And it is my absolute honour to be able to work for the renewable energy sector, which is the only sector really in Australia that has been delivering any emissions reductions of any sort. And this is the renewable electricity journey over the last eight years. You can see that period of stagnation when we lost the carbon price and then we also had Tony Abbott um, uh, insist on reducing the renewable energy target uh, down from 41,000 gigawatt hours down to 33. And in that period, we had this real moment of stagnation. The investors stopped investing. We didn't have any clarity. So it got downgraded to a lower target. But as soon as that clarity was in place, uh, people started investing. And so you've seen a steady rise since then. Now, there's some headwinds upon us in the future, but I'll, first of all, let's t I want to talk to you about where we are. So we're doing quite well. We had a solid year last year. We deployed about 2.3 gigawatts of large-scale renewables, um, 20 projects in all, and some good movement in terms of large-scale storage, which is something that we're really going to need a lot more of over time in order to firm up the renewables. But the real bright spot is really uh, rooftop solar. Um, Australians are world leaders, um, as you'll be, as you'll know. You remember, I mentioned 20 projects for large scale. Well, you can call it 310,352 projects across Australian rooftops uh, for homes and businesses, and I just think that that's the most remarkable um, achievement. And 2.7 gigawatts, so actually higher than the total installed in Australia on large scale. Australian rooftops um, and households did more than that, um, built more than that. So we now have um, solar on around a third of Australian households, which is incredible. I just thought you might want a little check in on the state's uh, rankings and league table. So New South Wales is coming up through the ranks slowly after having a bit of a, a, bit of a lost decade of its own. Um, but we've really seen some of the leading policy for renewable energy development now um, in, in New South Wales um, with its um, roadmap and um, long-term energy um, service agreements that it's, it's running out and its renewable energy zones across the, across the state. 
So, a few twists and turns and hills coming up, which I just thought I would mention. Now, um, I'll just go to this slide first. So this is a quote from my CEO. If you'll be aware that we have got an 80, or an aspiration, it's not actually a target of this government, but an aspiration that, or an expectation that by the end of this decade, 2030, we'll be at around 82% renewables in our system, which is fantastic. Um, but at the moment, we are not actually on track for that. We're deploying at probably a bit less than half, or we need to double or two to three times the amount of um, deployment that we've got in the large-scale sector each year. And we're not, we're not getting it out fast enough. So this is something we need to address. And as you can see here, this is the um, investment in large-scale developments over time. And you can see that it's actually a downwards um, curve rather than an upwards one when we actually need to be drastically increasing its slowing. So this is something we're a little bit concerned about at the moment. Uh, so what are, what are the problems? Well, one of them is transmission. This is a quote from the CEO of the Australian Energy Market Operator on Monday, Daniel Westerman, who said... Um, we're doing about 37% um, uh, generation at the moment in quarter one, and that aligns with our 36% of the share of the, of the market at the moment in Australia. But we could have gone a lot further. From our control room, we can see that increasing amounts of solar and wind generation are being curtailed because there's not enough transmission capacity to transport it. So we've got a real problem that we haven't actually built the runway yet for the sector to take off. Now, we need to build it much more quickly. It's a very long and slow process, and we're starting probably a decade behind time. And so this is probably our most fundamental issue here at the moment. The second one is that we've got a renewable energy target that runs out in 2030. And beyond that, we don't have any policies um, in place that are there to incentivize incentivise renewables after 2030. There's no carbon price, there's no renewable energy target. And so investors are saying, well, you want me to keep building, uh, competition on the grid gets harder, there's more curtailment, it gets harder, um, it's you know, more concentration of, of assets along the transmission, it gets harder to build the business case for that. And so you do need some long-term support so that they know that um, there will be a way to um, justify the business case, particularly as we get to higher degrees of penetration within the grid. And so that's one of the things that we're quite focused on at the moment, is that we really don't have a long-term policy um, market signal um, to encourage that beyond 2030. And let's remember, these are long-lived assets. Solar and wind farms, they cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build, and they have lives of you know, 30 years, and so to expect investors to invest on that basis when we've got a policy that runs out in seven years, I think is a bit of a stretch. We've also got planning bottlenecks, as you'd expect. I guess there's a lot of development going on, but let's just remember too, we don't have anywhere near the amount of development that we're going to need. The Australian energy market operator in its plan for the system says that to get to 98% renewables by 2050, which is what they model and expect can happen under their step change scenario, sorry for using jargon, we need to increase renewables by nine times. So we've got 27 years and we need to increase renewables in the system by nine times. So for us to do that, it's going to take a lot of work to make sure that we make it as efficient as possible to build. Now that's not to say we should be taking shortcuts when it comes to things like community consultation. And this brings me to the fourth point, which is to say that um, it's very important that we um, work as a sector, and it's been acknowledged by all the leaders across the sector that probably the most fundamental challenge beyond transmission and things of that nature is actually making sure that we bring regional communities together with us. because. Um, we know that these projects will, by and large, be in regional areas and um, that's going to have impacts and so we've got to do it in a way that's going to be welcomed by communities and not resisted. 
Finally, just a slide on what you can do. So, first of all, continue to advocate for strong climate action in the parliament. This parliament and everyone thereafter, every parliament should be a climate parliament from now on. Um, either invest in rooftop solar for your home or business, or you could call your retailer and ask to buy 100% government accredited green power, which means that it's additional to the mandated renewable energy target. So you're saying, I'd like to go further than what the government already makes the retailer buy. I would like to do a bit extra. And so for that, you need to ask for green power. And finally, and this is a great segue to the next speaker, electrify your home appliances or machines, as Saul likes to call them, as you can afford to. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, there's so much more to do, and uh, we absolutely uh, need to get there. Which, um, now, our um, next speaker, Sol Griffith, uh, has brought a real change in Australia. He was an architect uh, in the US uh, around the Inflation Reduction Act, and he'll talk a little bit about that, I hope. Um, but he is an engineer and an entrepreneur, specialising in clean and renewable energy technologies. I like to think that you're a visionary or a dreamer of what we can be, right? We have to think of the glass half full, not the glass half empty. Everybody needs to stop thinking of all the reasons why we can't or why it might be hard and think about the ways in which we can do it. Um, Sol has founded a do dozen technology companies across 20 years in Silicon Valley. He's the author of three books, including Electrify and The Big Switch. He's recently turned his attention to Other Lab, his independent research and development lab, to policy work and writing. And that's included, and you probably have seen on, uh, on uh, Australian Story, Rewiring uh, America, Rewiring Australia, nonpartisan organisations dedicated to the electrification and decarbonisation, um, and uh, the associated policy and regulatory implications of meeting climate goals, ultimately to keep temperature in check. Uh, make sure we have healthier, more efficient uh, ways of living. And keeping in mind, cost of living is a massive issue. We know that. And we know one of the biggest ways to address cost of living is decarbonisation. And that's where Sol is an absolute expert and has a vision that can help us all. Sol. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Zali. Actually, thank you, everyone up here uh, and out there. Leslie, I cried during your talk. Um, it is that when you really look at it, it is truly daunting what we have to do. Thank you for looking at it every day for the rest of us. Um, and thank you everyone for coming out. Like there is, the, the sea change in Australia is real. Two weeks ago I was in Canberra, Friday night, seven o'clock, and 800 people filled an audience to talk about climate solutions. And then on Saturday afternoon, on a perfect day in Thrull on, on Saturday, 3 p.m., we overflowed the local public library with the community meeting like you are meeting here to figure out how to implement climate solutions in their community. So it's you showing up, and I'll come, I'll come back to this hopefully at the end of my little brief intro here, that is going to make the difference. Um, I also normally have slides, lots of them, and I hand draw them, and I use them as a crutch so I know what I'm going to talk about. So I'm, I'm at danger of going rogue tonight, <laughs> I'll say that at the start. Uh, if there are any, re, um, any Australian story questions, I'll refer you to my wife in the second row. <laughs> she was the star after all. Um, thanks for being my wife. Um, what a burden. Um, I was called between when President Biden got elected and the first day of the White House um, by a guy called Tim Ryder, who's a spectacular public servant who works for Chuck Schumer, whose office was drafted to present the, it, at that, that point, it might have been called a Green New Deal, um, to the US Congress. And he said, you're the guy who's modeled the US energy economy most interestingly. Can you just ballpark for us what it costs to get 50% emission reductions by 2030? And I called a former intern of mine and I asked for three days. Three days later, we came back and like, Round figures, $4 trillion will get us the, on target for the one and a half degree-ish um, outcome you need. 
Uh, we then slogged it out for 18 months um, and we got a $369 billion bill. Right? World's largest climate bill ever. Um, incredibly proud of my small part in it and the whole bill and everything, but um, the tragedy of my job is I have to criticise the governments I'm trying to help <laughs> and it's not fucking enough. Um, maybe if it goes really well, all of the measures in the Inflation Reduction Act, 20, 25% emission reductions by 2030. Um, the, there is also an infrastructure bill that got passed. There was a Defence Production Act that got passed. They'll get a little bit more. The US government is now leaning on the EPA to create rules for vehicle standards, something that Australia should do, that will basically make it impossible to buy an internal combustion engine after 2030. Even that's not fast enough, but they are doing that to try to get closer on track. Um, that was um, really interesting and it and made me understand that actually we're only going to get the climate policy we demand by showing up. I was reminded of that this morning. A colleague shared with me the EPA's new projection, projections of carbon dioxide emissions for the US. And it had two lines on it. Pre-Inflation Reduction Act decarbonisation trajectory, post-Inflation Reduction Act um, trajectory. And there's this huge step change. But what you should take home from that is literally the agency that's in charge of figuring out the trajectories of the emissions changes for the US didn't have the boldness to imagine a new political reality of something like the Inflation Reduction Act. So the, and this is very, very, and even more true in Australia. The agencies that are tasked with this task are not being politically ambitious enough in the models. We're putting bullshit in and we're giving ourselves bullshit out. And I love everything that um, Tim and Anna said but actually, because we haven't modelled in sector coupling, what happens when we have to electrify our transportation sector, what happens when we, have, when we electrify all our home heat and our businesses and our industry, actually a lot of the numbers you said, like the nine times, are off by some factors. So that's where we are, that's pretty scary. Um, I do think we've had an incredible change with this government. I think we are extraordinarily lucky that we have Zali and the other independents in there fighting for us. They're going to be absolutely critical in this fight. The nation is going to owe David Pocock a lot <laughs> um, beyond his football career. Um, but to put it in perspective, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act is insufficient, as I said. It was $370 billion. If you take the $1.6 billion for electrification in, that was announced in this budget, that's excellent, but pro rata to America, it's about... 10% of the um, ambition and commitment in the Inflation Reduction Act. In the Inflation Reduction Act, 3% of it was dedicated to hydrogen, largely as a hedge that maybe that'll work next decade. The wrong message was taken by the Australian government, lobbied by the gas industry and other agents, and people who wanted the handout, and so $2 billion was for green hydrogen in this budget. That will not deliver any emissions reductions in Australia this decade, the decade where we need to get big emissions reductions. It may be the right investment to make some commitment next decade and some emissions reductions, so we need it as well. But its effect is more likely to increase the price of electricity for real Australians this decade than to decrease it. And that $2 billion could have been spent on you. All right? The safeguard mechanism is nice and interesting, but like, I don't think anyone, anyone understands the safeguard mechanism? Tim. Tim does. <laughs> it's a lovely piece of very complicated industrial policy that looks like subsidies for industry to move slowly. Um, the rewire the nation is a good investment. We need a lot of transmission. It was $20 billion set for transmission. We've deployed $14 billion already, but we don't really even know what is the optimal place to put those projects. So we've handed out the money to some very happy contractors before we've really done the planning required. And the danger for this government, and I hope we all let them know, is like, we know that it takes a long time to build those big transmission projects. It takes a long time to build those transmission lines. Those are also emissions that aren't going to happen this decade. Right? So then let's go even further. The government committed to 43% emissions reductions. 
uh, but it used the 26% of the previous government's commitments that have now largely been shown to be bullshit, technical term. And so we're a long way off. Um, so this is why I am very loud about the half of the Inflation Reduction Act that hasn't yet really made it into Australian energy policy except for this small commitments to electrification that came in this budget. That is the demand side. That's where you live, that's where your rooftop is, that's where your cars are. So Australia has had industry lobbying and driving climate policy forever because they want to line up for the handout and they've threatened with, well, if we don't get the handouts, then the exports will go away. One of our biggest emitters is using fossil fuels in Australia to dig up fossil fuels and send them overseas. Right? If we just stop the fossil economy, then that's that big piece of emissions that goes away. And that has perverted what we think. That's why the government will tell you, oh, your emissions in your cars and houses don't really count. But once you eliminate the fossil fuel economy, the majority of emissions in Australia are your, your cars and your homes. And that is the near-term opportunity. So that's why I'm very much a champion for a, a much bigger response to the Inflation Reduction Act. And I have good reason to believe that this government wants to do that for the next budget. And I think they will sharpen their pencils. I will say the following thing. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, all of the modelling efforts were done by one university and three independent groups, including Rhodium Group and Rewiring America, which I founded. So we couldn't lean on government modelling efforts to model the ambition required. That's also going to be true leading into this. So I'm looking, I know I'm going to be calling you tomorrow asking you for some help on this. But like, we're going to have to model what we want the country to deliver. And then I'm going to need all of you to show up in very loud political voice with the 700 people that were in Canberra and the 400 people that were in Thoreau and another 50,000 people from around the country. We need to make the largest environmental movement the world has ever seen. We've got to build something 100 times bigger than Greenpeace, 100 times faster. And whereas we've had 50 years of environmental groups saying, shut the gate, shut it down, close it up, you know, don't do it, glue my hand to the painting, we need to create together the world's largest climate movement around, yes, we now know what to do, and we fucking demand it of you. Excuse my friend. <laughs> Great, so I'll see you all on the steps of Parliament House, <laughs> first week of February. Um, good, I mean that. I mean, we're building the airplane as we're taking off here. <laughs> um, so then here comes the challenge of, uh, of that. We also have to do a lot of the industrial things, and we will have to do some hydrogen. All the other stuff is good. But the emissions we can really deliver this decade are in the Australian economy. The good news is, and I've modelled the economics of this transition for households in Europe, in North America, in Asia, and Australia. Hands down, we have the easiest run on this. So one reason the Inflation Reduction Act is called the Inflation Reduction Act is because I made a slide presentation with my colleagues in the final days where it was still going to be called the Build Back Better Biden Climate Program. And the title of that slide deck was Electrification is Anti-Inflationary. So for the Australian, I, I had American data, but I'll say it for Australia. So cost of all of the fuels of running your household in 1980 was about $2,000 a year. That's the petrol, the diesel, the natural gas, the electricity that you purchase that's mostly generated with coal. That increased pretty much linearly at the rate of inflation through to 2020 at about $5,500 a, $5 a, $5 a year. And then the last couple of years, it's really shot through the roof to seven or 8000 because of the Putin premium we're paying on petrol and the gouging of the Australian natural gas industry of its own citizens, to put it bluntly. Um, I think we just have to be really blunt all the time now, all the way to the finish line. Um, so if I took the, same, the Australian household that's paying $7,000 a year today, and you've got 1.8 cars, so I give you 1.8 electric cars in the driveway, I electrify your kitchen, I electrify your water heater, electrify your space heating systems, Put solar on your, put a battery on your house. You'll be paying $2,000 a year for all of your energy uses, all the same kilometres you drive, all the heating, for 20 or 30 years in the future. Because you've now, you've, when you buy solar, you've bought 20 years of energy up front. And you've bought it on finance, and so you've got this sort of thing. So we literally have the inflationary effect of fossil fuels 
and the anti-inflationary effect of electrification. So it's $7,000 to $2,000 in Australia. In America, petrol is called gasoline and it's cheaper. Natural gas is cheaper. They don't have sunshine as good as us. They haven't had the rooftop solar miracle. So they'll only be saving $1,000 or $2,000 a year. And that happens for them in 2030. In Australia, it starts happening you know, re really this year for energy intensive households and by 2025, every Australian household's in the money. So we can afford to go faster and harder than every other country in the world. I think unless Australia does that, and this is your laggard to leader, the rest of the world won't go as fast as it can. As soon as you show that this works somewhere, and oh look, actually the health outcomes have improved, the children are happier, the educational outcomes are improving, everything is improving, household bills have been smashed, then I think we could give the permission for the rest of the world to go bigger. So I think our response to the Inflation Reduction Act needs to be big enough to make this happen soon enough that we actually speed up the rest of the world. And that's the gift that Australia could give to the world in the climate sense when we go from laggard to leader. I'll just finish with the last thing, which is my conundrum. We've got you all anxious tonight. It's an emergency. It's absolutely an emergency. It's worse than you thought yesterday. Thanks, Leslie. <laughs> um, and so I want you to now be really anxious and act. And I want you to make, and the action I want you to take is I want you to make seven good decisions over the next 20 years. So the, <laughs> our challenge narratively is it's an emergency. You have to do it immediately but I want you to make seven good decisions. And what I mean by that is it's unlikely, we're not gonna go out and take everyone's car away tomorrow and give them the electric car. So some people might have bought a Toyota Corolla or I guess we're, this part of Sydney, maybe you bought a Volvo or a Range Rover last year. That's got 20 more years on it. I'll tell you my Range Rover joke in a second because that guy giggled. Um, we, uh, what we need you to do is when your next car is retiring, your next vehicle needs to be electric, then the next car retirement. We can never afford to buy a single fossil fueled machine again to stay on a target under 1.8 degrees. So that's the urgency. That means you have to move faster than the free market. You have to get over neoliberal ideas that the market will solve this. That's just, that was possible in 2000, okay? Now science has taken over. We have to figure out how to go faster than the market allows. We've got to be blunt about that because we're going to be browbeaten with neoliberal e econometric arguments for why we can't do this. Okay? So that's super important. So anyway, every time one of your machines fails, I want you to electrify it and I want you to max out your solar. I want you to also demand of me and demand of Zali and demand of the government that we do regulatory reform. Our energy regulators are not fit for purpose. They're still trying to protect point source generating industries of the last century. They do not recognize that your rooftops will be the largest generator in Australia. They do not recognize that your cars will be the largest battery in Australia. They are still not treating you equally, nor is the government via its economic incentives. And that's what we need to fight for. I'm sure I had other ideas. Oh, Range Rover joke. Anyone want the Range Rover joke? <laughs> Anyone buy a Range Rover last year? Wise choice you just made, whoever did. Um, okay, so the top shelf Range Rover you can buy is $248,600. If you instead spent $46,000 buying a Hyundai Kona Electric, you'd have enough money left over to spend $15,000 on a gigantic solar system, another $10,000 in battery, buy the most expensive induction cooktop you can for $10,000, buy the most expensive water you can for $3,000, water heater for $3,000, most expensive electric heating system for $10,000, you'll still have $100,000 to send the kids to private school left over. <laughs> and you won't be a planet fucking hypocrite. All right, let's do this. Okay, hopefully no reps for Land Rover <laughs> in the audience. Um, but it does go to show there are there is obviously 
my role representing you in Parliament is we need to move the dial. We need to come up with uh, innovation when it comes to the regulatory system. And Anna, you'll be very pleased to know that I'm working on a private member's bill for a renewed renewable energy target and a renewable energy storage target. Um, so we, we, we are pushing down those ways. Um, but oh, so I've got a few questions that you put in when you registered to come tonight and I thought we'd cover some of those and then we'll, we'll throw it to the floor. Um, so we've talked about some, uh, the ambitions. I mean, there is that gap between it's one thing to set the targets, then you need to make sure the policies are there to achieve them. And we need to ensure we have the data and measuring occurring to make sure we keep everyone to account on what's actually happening. And I'll speak a bit more on that. But we have got um, local, we've had a recent announcement as far as Victoria's commitment, but we have got, for example, uh, 2035 targets. Tasmania has committed to net zero by 2030, so they're way ahead. Victoria is now committed to 75 to 80% by 2035. New South Wales is committed to 70% by 2035. So I'm, as I said, and I'll speak a little bit more about it in a minute, um, launching 75 by 35 as needing to be our next, our minimum commitment for the 2035 nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. And that's really important because, as Tim says, it sets the signal, and as Anna said, it sets that signal for investment. We can't expect uh, big investment with just a seven-year leadway. They need longer. They need to know where the, t where the trajectory is. But I wanted to ask the panel, uh, and maybe I'll start with Leslie, because I think ultimately it's from the science. Our goal is 1.5 degrees of warming, and we should be working our way backwards from that goal of how do we achieve it and not the other way around. Um, what are your thoughts on where our next targets need to be, our trajectory to net zero, and what should we be looking at for 2035? Well, I'll firstly put on my Climate Council hat because, um, as many people would know, we put out a report, I think, two years ago now that said we should be at 75% 75, 75 by 2030, so it's even more ambitious, and be at net zero by 2040, and we've rolled that back now to 2035. So it's absolutely where we need to be. And that target was worked out not only on the basis of what we could do because we've got such fantastic renewable resources, but on the basis of what we should do in terms of, as you say, being a leader and kind of making up for, for the laggardness of the Australian government thus far. So it was partly um, compensating for the bad things we'd already done but also being realistic about the resources that we have. So I'm all in favour of 75 by 35, and if that's the floor, even better. Tim, from an investment point of view, what does it mean if, as we compare to the rest of the world? We know announcements are being made. Uh, we know the UK are committed to 78% by 2035. Uh, I believe uh, the EU are as, uh, even higher, um, around the 80. Um, where do you see the... What kind of lever does it do for investment long-term for Australia to set an ambitious 2035? I think it's critical and uh, the uh, problem is where we're starting and it comes back as Leslie said, uh, Australia is a petro state. We are the third largest exporter of fossil fuels. The export sector for fossil fuels alone last year was $220 billion. It's the highest it's ever been. Now, if you think economically, that is actually a serious problem for Australia, which is why I say this is a threat and an opportunity. We need to replace $220 billion of really profitable exports. We need to think really big about what else we can do because that has to stop. And Australia at the moment is one of the prior states of the world, so we have to lead. So uh, Saul made the comment we've got to illustrate through electrification. And I think that's 100% right. But from an investment perspective to, to your question, it's I really see Australia as a world leader and helping other countries decarbonise through embodied decarbonisation in our exports. So let me just give you one number. Lithium. Australia produces half the world's lithium, 50%. We should be refining all of that lithium and exporting it. 
and refining it using renewable energy. And so that's why I get excited when Western Australia says they're going to build 50 gigs of renewables. That's actually to power the three world leading lithium refineries we're building in Western Australia right now. And in fact, one of them just Albemarle of the America just announced last week they're doubling the size of it to 100,000 tonnes, the biggest lithium hydroxide factory in the world. So value adding our exports before we export them using our world leading renewables. So we actually export embodied decarbonisation. So think iron ore. We export 38% of the world's iron ore. Let's export green iron rather than iron ore. Embodied decarbonisation. Help Korea, Japan and China decarbonise their economy, be a world leader rather than a laggard. Yeah, Anna. Oh, what are your thoughts on where we're at and what, how important a strong 2035 target? Um, right. Well, I just wanted to hark back to 2016, 2017 and those that remember that time when the uh, renewable energy target after the stalemate and the standoff about reducing it down to 33 from 41 and all investment had stopped... I remember a big debate, oh, I think I was at the Climate Change Authority at the time, of saying, oh, well, there's no way the sector could ever achieve even the lower target. Now, they certainly can't do 41, but maybe they can't do 33,000 gigawatt hours either. And we smashed it ahead of time. And that's the power of setting a firm target with a clear, a clear runway. It wasn't a long runway, but... Um, the investment came. You set a long-term target, the investment will come. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so much has poured into that country in the space of the last nine months. So it's something we absolutely need, a big, hairy goal, um, long-term, big, hairy goal. Set long-term targets and investors will come. So how are we going to... We're going to electrify. So the proportion of electrification that we need, how much do you think it's going to be driven as well by um, people... Well, I guess getting behind strong targets that then drives ambition and will to do the, the yards that need to be done? I like the fact that you're setting a high target. Targets don't really matter. It's the policies and the, whether the policies are tracking towards the target. The ambition gap between announced targets and policy is like one and a half degrees right now. So people have announced targets that sort of maybe are two-ish degrees, but the policies of the governments that have, have said targets is like three and a half degrees. So I applaud the effort for the target, but I'm going to be the guy that says this is bullshit and we actually have to make it into policy. And let's talk about some of the bullshit and we have someone who contributed to the IPCC reports here. Australia is one of the petro states that corrupted the IPCC process by heavily putting the hand on the tiller of let's use negative emissions to make us believe that we can hit a one and a half degree trajectory. So much so that you cannot hit a one and a half degree trajectory without negative emissions. And on page 3966 of the IPCC AR15, and yes, someone reads your reports, Leslie. <laughs> The IPCC disowns its own assessment of, of negative emissions by saying the IPCC does not speak to the technical feasibility of the 20 gigatons in negative emissions annually by the end of the century as modelled, right? But we are still making safeguard mechanisms as though all of those negative emissions are going to happen and, like, we're still pretending that this shit's real. It's not. Um, those negative emissions were that are modelled into the IPCC one and a half scenarios mean that you'd have to build an industry as large or twice as large as all of the existing fossil fuel industries on the planet by the latter half of this century and be pumping a negatively priced product back into the ground. Right? It's not going to happen. So we've got to call that bullshit. We're on target just the machines that exist in the world today. If they all live out their natural life, that's 1.8 degrees. If we retire from you know, the majority of the coal plants early, that's 1.65, 1.7 degrees. Right, so we now need perfect execution. And so I will be calling foul on any, pol any target that isn't matched by policy. But unfortunately, you don't have the power because I know that you would make it policy as early if that was your power. So you can set the target. But let's figure out how to hack this government 
to make the policy that works. Um, electrification is how we're going to do pretty much the majority, 90-95% of the emissions reductions for everything except for agriculture and land use. Hydrogen is an electrification technology. It starts with electrons. Um, and then just, you know, to give you, my first degree was metallurgical engineering at the New South Wa University of New South Wales. My first job was on the rolling mill in Newcastle making steel. Um, we do export an awful lot of iron ore. We process only 1% of our iron ore into steel domestically. Everyone wants to sell you this story that we're going to replace that $200 billion export industry with hydrogen. It's really not going to happen. If all we did, so the price of hydrogen, the stretch goal price for hydrogen in the Australian government is $2 a kilogram by 2030. That's six cents a kilowatt hour effectively before it's even been stored and transported. So it's really going to be 12, 15 cents a kilowatt hour. The price of natural gas or coal, the heating element as it goes into the steel making process is a half or one cent per kilowatt hour. The price of steel, half of the price of steel is determined by the price of energy. If we're going to use $2 a kilogram hydrogen to make steel, it's going to be six, eight, ten times more expensive than steel today. So that's not how it's going to play out. The only way we can really do it is make one cent a kilowatt hour wind and solar, which is forecastable and seeable from where we are, and feed that directly to turning Australian iron ore into steel here. If we processed all of our iron ore, or all 101 million tonnes into steel domestically, that would be a little over a trillion dollars as an export industry. So let's be really realistic. What we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of metallurgy here. We're going to make aluminium instead of bauxite. We're going to make steel and iron instead of ore. We're going to make lithium brines at least instead of lithium dirt. Um, and that is how we literally will have 10, 20 times uh, the export industry if we want to go that big. Um, so let's, dangle, let's be honest and, and have targets and, and dangle some carrots. Well, I, I think I just wanted to say you need you need a mechanism to go with your target. This is the main thing. You can't just have a, a target which is an aspiration. It actually has to have something to underpin it, and I think that's the problem that we've got at the moment. So we've probably a question that came through. We've touched on it a little bit, but around how do we turn our economic system away from dependence on consumption and extraction, uh, dig and ship, and how do we towards well-being and circular sustainability? Um, so. I will throw back to you, that's all. I love this one. I think this really speaks to something someone said earlier, like we need a vision of where we're going. Let me paint you a picture of the future. So the next book I'm working on right now is actually on all of the material flows through humanity. So the single thing that humans move in the largest volume every year is carbon dioxide, more than everything else we do. You're an average Australian, I'll just point any one of you. You're emitting about 15 tonnes of CO2 per year and about five tonnes of fly ash and other waste from the combustion of fossil fuels. So there's 20 tonnes of shit that you're just throwing out in the world. We don't really call that trash, right? unfortunately yet. That's the problem. But <clears throat> if I electrify your whole life and we do it with 50% wind, 50% solar, 50% store that in batteries with, of some kind. Um, you're going to need about 50 kilograms a year of the steel and copper that makes wind turbines. You're going to need about 50 kilograms a year of the glass and the silicon and the aluminium that makes solar. You're going to need about 50 kilograms a year of the nickel, the lithium, the aluminium that makes the batteries. But all of those things are metals. Metals are the things that humans are the best at recycling. We can probably recycle upwards of 90% of all of those things. Very, very likely at the end of the century, we're going to have global population decline. That's the amazing miracle of where the world's um, demographics are at. And so you can actually imagine a future where we are net zero mining 2100. We've got all the lithium out of the ground that we need. We've got all the copper out of the ground that we need. We've got all the nickel out of the ground that we need. We've actually really focused in Australia on innovating the recycling industries to recycle all of this. And so think of that as an extraordinary lightening of the burden on Mother Earth compared to the 20 tonnes that we wrestle out of the ground for each of you every year today. So that like, is a narratable 
feasible technologi technological vision. It also says that selling our lithium once to Korea so they can lease us the batteries back is a bad idea, an unsustainable business model. So Australia actually should be thinking very hard about why aren't we leasing or renting all of these metals that are going to do this transition so that we have recurring revenue for centuries. Thank you. <laughs> Did you want to add to that question, Tim? There we go. Okay. So as we talk about electrifying, so we, we, we can talk about, uh, yes, agriculture, uh, the agriculture sector from, from methane. But when we talk about electrifying your homes, it's not just about disrupting the consumption model of fossil fuels that we all play a part in, right? Um, we know about 75% of our emissions are from our urban environments, from our cities, from our lifestyle, from our houses, our cars, our consumption. Um, a big part of that has health impacts when it comes to methane, but one of the things that we haven't talked about a lot that I've been focusing on, but it is going to be very much uh, on, on topic this year, is we need to talk about methane. Uh, and it's not just from the agriculture sector, it's the... Um, it is the emissions from our fossil fuel sector. And it's something I was talking about with Leslie, is it's incredibly important. The world has committed, or most countries in the world have committed to a methane cut by of 30%. But as Leslie said, methane is our most, um, oh, sorry, was it Leslie? Or, and I can't remember who it was. But uh, the most, one of the most potent warming gases impacts, right? So if we want to slow down warming of while we've, this transition is occurring, if we want to avert the worst of warming, we must deal with methane now. This is not something we deal later because we know it is so potent in the short term. So maybe, Leslie, can you explain a little bit where we're at? Because it's quite mind-boggling that we have methane emissions uh, from uh, coal and gas extraction that is not properly measured. If you don't measure it, you don't properly appreciate it and you certainly don't regulate it. So a first step has to be around measuring of methane. Thanks, Ali. Okay, so there's, there is, I, I don't usually deliver good news, you know, so it's not my thing, but um, there is some good news. There is some good news about methane measurement. So Tim and I, for example, um, a couple of months ago were very interested to hear a webinar from some very clever people at the University of Melbourne who are now part of Roscano's Superpower Institute, which was launched about a month ago. Um, very clever atmospheric physicist by the name of Peter Rayner can now uh, has developed a tool that uses satellite data and a smart algorithm to be able now to measure methane hourly from any point in the world um, to about, I think it was 25 by 25 metre resolution. That's really, really small, wasn't smaller. it? Or smaller. When that tool is delivered, which will hopefully be in the next couple of months, there'll be an open access dashboard online that anybody will be able to go to. You'll be able to put in a location and it will tell you how much methane came from that location in the last hour or the last week or the last month. Now, as you can imagine, um, there's some groups like Lock the Gate that are very, very excited about this because it's been estimated by an international report that Australia's methane emissions are underreported by about 60% because of the crudity, partly the crudity of our, our measuring and also because it is suspected that some fossil fuel companies are not being entirely honest. Who, who'd have thought? <laughs> anyway, um, they won't be able to get away with that anymore because it will be all online and you'll be able to go and have a look. So I think that really is exciting. What it does mean, however, politically, is that it throws our 43% um, up into a sort of a chaotic space because we're going to have to recalculate how much methane Australia emits. That changes our whole emissions profile and there'll be, you know, a lot of... Um, a lot of work to do after that, but I do think it's a really exciting development and it does show that not all science is depressing. Uh, 
I'm hoping it's Ali, but it might have been Allegra, but one of the two of you snuck into the um, safeguard mechanism, the um, absolute emissions number, which is gold, because I am 100% of the view that the uh, coal industry in particular deliberately, massively understates their methane emissions, and uh, all of a sudden they're actually going to be held to that because of the safeguard mechanism um, enhancements that the uh, that Zali was able to get through and the Greens. And I think that enormously puts the pressure back on the coal industry. Now the coal industry is something like 30 or 40 percent of Australia's methane emissions. and. Uh, up until now, they've been able to use a rule that the mining lobby groups um, wrote about 40 years ago that the CSI rubber stamp, I think they had a sample of four um, coal samples. Anyway, I'm not the scientist, that's Leslie's area. At the end of the day, if we actually get monitoring, verification and reporting of these emit emitters, uh, methane emitters, then we can hold them to account. And if their emissions are, as the IEA said, 60% higher <coughs> on average than what we're actually reporting, and we get a rule change that changes it from global warming of potential of 100 to 20, all of a sudden it blows the budget out, which means the safeguard mechanism is an act of government and uh, gives them the big stick to actually hold the coal industry to account as the number one source of methane in Australia. Yes, no, in the negotiations on safeguard mechanism, there was, for me, it was that we needed to acknowledge a reduction of gross emissions, regardless of what is being offset, the gross emissions has to reduce. Allegra had the number, you're very right on that, but I was pushing very much around the inclusion of methane, and that is coming. There will be a review of the Nagur Act this year, um, and the government is under pressure to tighten up the data, the measuring, and the, uh, the reporting around methane. Methane. Now, what's important, and Anna can speak to this, is the impact that has on health. Uh, methane it has a huge impact on health. And we hear, we heard during COVID, the previous government talked about a gas recovery. Uh, and unfortunately, I'd have to say, even under this government, we still have a very strong focus on gas. There is this idea that more, uh, can be, more basins can be opened. We've got the Beetaloo Basin being fracked. Uh, we have PEP 11 still off our coast, still hasn't been ruled out by both the state and federal government, and we're still pressing on that. Um, so we really need to talk about that gas is not a transition fuel, right? We already have enough. There's enough in the system. Uh, in fact, we need to move away for many, many reasons. Anna, we know we've already got really enough gas in the system. But can you talk a little bit for people to understand is maybe personally, you know, what does cooking with gas, for example, do from a health impact? What, uh, why is it so important that we then move to that electrification, not just because of reducing emissions um, and for cost, but it's also health uh, and demand? I won't blame you Mew, that time, that was my fault. Um, yeah, look, I think we, um, we, there's been increasing studies over time about it having a damaging effect on um, res um, for respiratory um, illnesses um, and um, um, inducing asthma as well or making asthma worse. Um, I think Saul can probably add more to that. I think, I, I think we really need to see, I'm, I'm actually, I'm a Victorian please forgive me, um, which is the highest um, user of gas for homes um, and businesses. And we've got a real uh, challenge in front of us in Victoria to get all the households off um, gas. And I really would like to see the state government there put their pedal to the metal in terms of um, supporting households to get off the gas because there's a real dependence there. Um, we're not seeing vocal communication from leaders about every decision you make from now on needs to be a decision to go electric. And I don't know why. We're not seeing as much of that as, as I would like to see. I actually think we need um, very well-resourced public information campaigns coming from government saying it's going to get more expensive over time to be on gas look to move off it as soon as you possibly can. Um, here's an incentive to make sure that you make a good purchase next time you change over an appliance. And we're not seeing that and I don't, I don't quite know why. I'm sure Saul will add in his uh, theories about that. But I think 
there's a real opportunity now for us to make sure that we don't lock in further um, decisions um, that will just make it more difficult and harder. One of the first things we need to do is help low-income households get off gas because they cannot be left to uh, pick up the bill for a increasingly costly gas network to maintain over fewer customers as we get further to, uh, through the electrification transition. So it's really important that we support lower income households as soon as possible uh, to make the shift. Um, and then, you know, the wealthier among us can, um, uh, can manage it as soon as we're able. Um, but we really need leadership at the moment to be encouraging every decision to be a good decision. So, Gual, we talk about household electrification. Maybe talk through exactly when you talk about the machines we all have in our houses to transition. Let's talk about what are the machines that need to change. Methane smells like shit. <coughs> actually, it's three sulfurous molecules that are often trapped with the methane that smell like shit. And actually, if you smell them carefully, you can tell whose fart it is. Um, which reminds me a lot of the gas industry's hype. So they're going to come back at us and tell us that they're going to mix hydrogen, put hydrogen in the pipes. That won't work. As a metal, the thing that sunk the Titanic was hydrogen in brittle men of steel. That will sink that idea. Um, of things that smell like shit on the topic of methane, one of them is that the Australian Energy Regulator gave the gas industry the right to charge every Australian who wants to disconnect from gas. Um, the, the, the gas company can charge you $1,100 for abolishment. They charge $100 to have someone come and turn the cock off. But even if you turn the cock off, the actual gas network itself is super leaky, so that won't stop all the emissions. So we're going to give the gas industry $10 billion on the way out. That seems wrong. So that's what's not fit for purpose about our regulatory bodies. It smells like shit. The, um, there's 10 million households. There'll be 11 or 12 million by 2035. Um, Roughly six million, I think, have gas cooking, about the same for the water heaters and space heaters. So there's, you know, 20-ish million gas appliances in Australian households. There's a bunch of bottled gas as well. Um, the bottled gas might go biomethane, maybe. that There will be some misinformation about that. That may or may not be a good idea. They'll try and tell you that that can offset all of the gas. It can't. You, we don't have enough things that fart in Australia to make all of the gas for our homes. So that's just to be honest about the two counterpoints in the public education campaign. Um, I have some optimism. I sat next to Penny Sharp last week at some event, and it's all a blur, I can't remember which one, but she was the first Australian politician who said to me, we need a public education campaign around all of these issues, including natural gas, including the fact that it's the leading cause of respiratory illness around the world. Um, breathing in, in, you know, the American Medical Association, if your child reports to a GP and says, I have respiratory problems, the first question they ask you is, do you use natural gas in the house, right? It's actually known to be the leading cause of reduction in life of pets, because the methane hangs around at their level. So if you care about your dog, cut your gas line, sue the Australian energy regulator for charging you $1,000 on the way out. Ask Zali to help me fight that fight. <laughs> Um, what else? Did I, what didn't I cover about this thing? It smells like shit. I think we're doing pretty good. All right. <laughs> okay. So we do have some roving mics. Where are the roving mics? Is there any questions from the floor? All right. I can see some hands up. I've got some of the team are here, and we'll get. Oh, I want to say one last thing on the way out. There's an excellent study from New York on. The death spiral, they call it, of defection from gas. So once you get about 10% of households to defect from gas, it'll nearly double the price of the gas network for the remaining customers. And if you want to know, you know, we're going to fail on our climate solutions, a death of a thousand paper cuts, and one of the biggest paper cuts that I'm really worried is the public backlash when low-income households are having seeing their gas go up and then all the nice fancy people who used to own a Range Rover are driving Teslas. Um, so unless we have a far more progressive 
response than America. So the Inflation Reduction Act was all tax concessions, so you had to be wealthy enough to qualify to get the concessions to get all the electric things. Australia has to go above and beyond on that and make sure this was why one of the most promising things in the budget just released was the effort on social housing. Um, but unless we lead with that and be very proactive, we're going to have a culture war around this gas problem like that, that really could be the death of our ambition on climate this decade. Okay, who's got the mic? Me. Um, can I ask two quick questions? That's all right? Okay. Once for, thank you all, that was awesome. Once for Sol, how do we go about uh, switching to induction, let's say? I know it's, it's, like you said, it's quite expensive. So how do I just go about doing it? What's the, give me a quick breakdown. Um, so induction stoves use magnets and magnetic coils to heat up the pan. And actually, it uses half as much energy as gas to cook, because that clean blue flame mostly kills your dog and goes up around the side of the pot without heating it. And the induction does all the heating. Um, you can buy a lot of reasonably priced induction cooktops now. They're about $1,000. And for every price point you spend on a gas range, you can find uh, induction equivalent. So there's $400 ones, there's $14,000 ones, there's everything in between. The actual real expense around induction is often you've got to run a new circuit because you want to have high power to that device. And if you're unlucky and the kitchen's on the opposite side of the house from where your electricity comes into the house, you're going to have to pay someone to drill four holes to run a dedicated high amp circuit. And so it might cost you $5,000 for the tradie to install the $1,000. Is it worse for clients. apartments? Hmm? Is it worse for apartments? Uh, it's a challenge in apartments and it's a challenge in strata and when you've got to ask other people for permission um, and we need answers for renters and strata. That's another challenge that I, like, I don't think we on the here have answers for. Um, you might need new pots and pans or you might need to get your mother's cast iron back out, which works spectacularly well with... Um, with induction, one of the best uh, steel pan companies in the world that matches with induction is an Australian company. Um, I can't remember the name, my sister probably does. Ask her, she's there. Um, Oz Iron make great induction pans. Um, anyway, Australia's success in solar was by doing um, policy and training programs that reduce the soft costs around installing solar on your roof. I think we need to have a similar focus on reducing the soft costs around induction, reducing the soft costs around installing the battery. Um, that in Australia was done in a clever way where it was combined with workforce training and with guaranteeing that those people were trained sufficiently so some of the liability was taken away from the tradies and carried by the government. That, that was clever. We need to be thinking about things like that so that we can make that $5,000 Costs go down to two or three thousand. Um, I started a company with a couple of friends in the US three years ago called Channing Copper Company. They, we are putting about six hundred dollars worth of batteries in the cooktop. Um, so you spend six hundred dollars for batteries. You don't have to pay the five thousand dollars for the circuit. So the the thing's just charging all day at low current, and then the battery gives you. It actually it's it's so amazingly fast. It's like five times faster than anything at cooking. Um, so there will be technological solutions. I'm not selling and spruiking that one specifically, but that is to say there are still opportunities for technological solutions and innovations that will make some of these things easier. Awesome, thank you. Um, a, a quick one. Um, Leslie, uh, regarding methane, given that Australia is the only advanced country in the world currently, which is alongside third world countries, well, like the Amazon, uh, the Borneo, the Congo Basin, where, when it comes to deforestation. Um, and of course, in conjunction with that is the methane emissions from agriculture. Why do you think is it that there is still not enough publicity when it comes to the detriments behind the um, animal agricultural industry that we have currently in Australia, which is devastating? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I think it all goes back to, you know, Australia's wealth is ridden on the back of the sheep and all of that sort of thing. I think the agricultural industry is sort of held up in sort of godlike um, 
yeah, in a godlike way. Um, I think a lot of people don't actually understand the the emissions costs of their food and their food choices. And I think, and I'd certainly am planning to do something with the Climate Council on that to actually give people the a bit more information about what their food is costing from a climate perspective so that people can make different choices. There's other sorts of real, some really interesting developing technology in the agricultural sector, especially in methane. So there's one thing about, you know, you can give um, these seaweed supplements to cows to reduce their methane. Unfortunately, at the moment, you have to give it to them every single day. So it's not very practical for rangeland beasts. But I think an even more exciting technology is another PV, not photovoltaics, but precision fermentation. So, you know, there's a lot of startups doing this now um, and fairly soon I think there will be synthetic milk in Australian supermarkets from the Eden Brew CSIRO startup, um, which has never seen the inside of a cow but will be chemically and biologically identical to milk. I will be buying it um, because the dairy industry is one of the most unsustainable industries from an animal welfare perspective, from a pollution perspective, from a land, water and fertiliser perspective of any agriculture anywhere. So um, I think the next few years, five to ten years, is going to be really exciting in the food industry because we're going to be able to buy animal protein that most of us like to eat that's never seen um, an animal. And there'll be some people that don't like that idea because it feels unnatural, but the environmental and climate benefits of that technology are gonna be out of sight. And animal welfare, and animal welfare absolutely. Hi, um, my name's Ria. I'm looking at this from the supply of the electricians that are gonna be needed to ele electrify the world. So I run a tech platform called Electrician Exchange. There are some stats that are really interesting. So 30% of the electricians currently are uh, over the age of 50. 17 to 25% of the apprentices aren't finishing their apprenticeship. Uh, there's a whole bunch of demand that's already out there. So electrical safety checks for Victoria, the VEU program, rooftop solar, only 30% of uh, uh, those that, that have had rooftop solar. So there's another at least 30 you know, to 40% still remaining to, to have that done, assuming not everyone does that. But with so much demand, and I completely agree with you. First of all, I completely agree we need to electrify the world. But where are the people going to come from to be able to electrify the world? And, and the questions to, questions to everyone. I can start a little. Um, the two people that had the biggest smiles in their face at this budget were from the ETU, the Electrical Trade Union. They had been working in the background to get the government to commit $3.7 billion in this budget to skills and training. Um, if that money is used well, that's fantastic. We need to invest in apprenticeships and we need to invest in things that look like TAFE that we gutted over the last two decades. Um, we need 10 to 20,000 electricians in a hurry. We need 10 to 20,000 HVAC technicians in a hurry. We need to do shorter certificate courses that um, up upskill you so it's not three years from level one to level two, et cetera, et cetera. I think you know, we need every single shot on goal. Um, the heroes in the army to electrify Australia, the world, will be the tradies and the technicians. We need them in enormous numbers. We're, we're not really, there's a few people, I can name the five people in Australia who I think are really thinking about this along the, with the urgency that you appropriately bring it up. Um, we're also under investing in metallurgists, biologists, chemical engineers. Um, we're not training the scientists and the engineers we need for the rest of this transition. I, the skills gap is huge. I think we can do it. World War I was precedent for how you do a whole lot of on-the-job training and on-the-job apprenticeships. And women who had never worked before uh, in 1939 were driving all of American manufacturing by 1943. And um, so women can do it. <laughs> that's, that's maybe our hope. <laughs> Unless that's something done about that, they'll be pretty 
this is why I think it was poor, poorly introduced, but this is really why um, AOC was really anxious that the Green New Deal also represented a new social contract to our young people in all of these investments. I still think that is true in Australia, and I think, um, I think Thomas Piketty is one of the best spokespeople in the world for this. We will not execute this energy transition on time unless it comes with a huge amount of social equity around the issues of who does the work and how we pay them and whether it's done by unions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't love to say that you, to predicate one on the other, but I kind of am coming around that this, this has to be thought of and we need to invest in these people and pay them fair, fair wages and invest in their skills in a way we have, we, you know, we're just coming off 40 years of Thatcher Reaganism. We maybe won't descend into that one just yet, but uh, it does show that none of these, um, well, solving this problem, accelerating our ambition, it doesn't happen in silo. Every sector relies on the other sector. So it's one thing when the government is announcing uh, spends when it comes to um, energy or innovation or transition, you also then have to look at the spend on education and on, on, on all those aspects. Every, it, this is an overarching commitment that has to be across every sector, from health to education to manufacturing to industry. And that's where it's really important. I don't know where the mic is, but go for it. <laughs> thank you, thank you Zali. Um, it, it's often said to every problem there is a solution, but unfortunately to every solution there can be several problems. And the solution that is being um, worked on very hard at the moment is hydrogen. I'm not quite sure how much it is a solution to all the world's problems, but there are at least three big issues with it. One, half of it's blue, which means that for every four volumes of hydrogen being made, there's one volume of carbon dioxide being released. Are we going to be able to convert all blue to green? Two, the um, burning of hydrogen in air just results in water, right? Wrong. You also get oxides of nitrogen, which is pollution, should we be burning hydrogen at all? Maybe there are cases we should. Why don't we burn hydrogen in oxygen? Because we're making exactly the right quantities of hydrogen and oxygen to burn the one in the other when we electrolyze water. Um, three, methane is a huge problem. That's <sighs> yes, right. Uh, how is it removed from the atmosphere? There is something called hydroxyl radicals which are cleaning up the atmosphere. A, a Nobel uh, scientist, uh, Paul Kruznitz, I think is his name, um, unfortunately died a couple of years ago. Um, he said um, that hydroxyl radicals are the detergent of the atmosphere. They are cleaning up methane. And if we let hydrogen escape fugitive hydrogen emissions, then they clean up the hydroxyl ions. They remove the hydroxyl ions. That's very bad news. And therefore, well, it's a question. What are we going to do about stopping hydrogen escaping? We have the better chances because we are making the hydrogen, not pulling it out the ground. So we should be able to... we take it to Leslie, the okay. scientist? No? So there's oh. a three, three different areas. Well, of Anna. <laughs> oh, Anna, by the way, the problem you're seeking for in terms of understanding is Murdoch. I, I can speak very honestly about hydrogen. Um, I spent part of my career developing hydrogen storage tanks for vehicles and sold all of that technology to Toyota and Porsche and Audi, and you can now buy tanks that I designed for storing hydrogen in. In that project, I got to shoot hydrogen tanks with large caliber bullets and watch them explode. I know all about hydrogen. So um, the first way hydrogen kills you is the pressure wave from the explosion collapses your lung. The second way it kills you just shortly afterwards is that you suffocate because it removes all the oxygen around you. And then the third way you die is burning to death in an invisible flame. It's a, let's just call it problematic. Um, that's three answers. Um, we absolutely need hydrogen for one thing as humanity and that's via the Haber-Bosch process to make ammonia. A huge amount of that ammonia is used as fertilizer for the world. We need fertilizer. It was the Green Revolution, but we're using an awful lot of that to feed cows to make dairy. So part of the problem, for, part of the solution is all of these other things that remove the need for hydrogen. Um, 
it is the gas industry that sells all of the world's hydrogen today. It's the gas industry that is absolutely involved outspending the renewable energy industry in Canberra, in Washington, by 100 to 1, lobbying for hydrogen as a solution. It was uh, the reason Japan Germany lost World War II is because they didn't have any liquid fuels. They invested terribly heavy in hydrogen as an idea so that they could have energy security. Those two nations' automotive companies are the laggards in the conversion of electric because they, they had such an addiction to the idea of hydrogen. Um, Australia, because they're our trading partners, is like, oh, it's a great idea. Um, hydrogen's going to be expensive, it's going to be dangerous, it's going to be used for far fewer things than people think. I think the, the inside baseball now is like brackets at between half a percent and five percent of all energy. The International Energy Agency, which is originally a cabal of fossil fuel developing nations, it wasn't an independent body to give independently good advice about the energy transition. Their model of 50% hydrogen in the energy economy by 2050 is fucking bullshit. And we just got to call this out. And Australia is absolutely over-investing in this idea. Will there be some hydrogen? Yes. Might there be some hydrogen making steel? Yes. Might there be some hydrogen doing agriculture? Yes. Might we make some money on it? Yes. But we are dangerously over-investing in the idea. It has these other leak problems that you've very accurately pointed out and we should be very concerned and we should have a very rapid national sane conversation with some science and not some gas industry lobbyists about hydrogen. Anna? We've got the wrap up so I'm going to be I'm going to be quick. I'm just going to add a little bit to what Saul said because I think Saul and I generally agree pretty much on most things. I might not say it in exactly the same way that he does, though. Um, hydrogen, we actually agree on, although I think he thinks that we probably don't. So let me just um, say this. The world currently uses 94 million tonnes or consumes 94 million tonnes of hydrogen a year. All of it is fossil fuel based. The big opportunity for Australia is to participate because we have better renewables than a confluence of wind and solar than any developed country on earth. And so we are a great um, potential lo location for producing green hydrogen. That's not to say we need to pump it into our households and into our businesses. That's the role of electrification. But hydrogen is used, as Saul says, for for fertilisers and other industrial processes and I think it has a role and if Australia sees an opportunity in um, utilising its, you know, um, world-beating renewable resources to produce green hydrogen for exports as, an, as a market expansion opportunity, great. Um, so I think we just need to be careful about making judgments about where it's used in the economy. It's probably not going to play a very big role in Australia's economy but it is a huge potential export opportunity and we need to think about that. Thank you. We're probably just going to last question because I realise we've got a little bit over time so I think I've got one mic there and for everyone else if I can't get to your question please um, write it in and we will deal with it um, through another way. <laughs> Hi there. I've got a question for specifically for Tim but for anyone else can in the panel can answer as well. I work in the ESG space and I've noticed the rise of the impact bond phenomenon, whether it's social bonds, green bonds, sustainability bonds, climate bonds, to what extent do you see these financial mechanisms impacting the, the, the climate well, change landscape, particularly in terms of carbon emissions and net zero outcomes, particularly in Australia? We definitely need to use finance. Finance is key. I come from finance, but at the end of the day, they're the ones with the trillions of dollars of capital that need to be deployed. We need the right financial instruments. They need to be properly policed. So what I, um, it was only $4 million, but Jim Chalmers did throw an extra $4 million in the budget to ASIC to enforce greenwash laws. And uh, that's critical. And it, Mercer Super got called out by ASIC, taken to court for greenwash. Greenwash is a form of investor deception. It is fraud. And ASIC's calling that out and policing it. And it's only through having proper regulation and proper enforcement that the money goes in the right place. So I think green bonds, sustainable bonds, all of that is critical to mobilising the capital. It's been critical to mobilising capital into India, a market I've studied for the last decade. Uh, it's all, I mean, the Paris Agreement was all about how do you get 
Western capital into emerging markets. The green bonds have actually done that in India, but it led with India having a really, really world-leading renewable energy strategy and the West coming to fund it because it was commercially logical. So I think they have a real place to a role to play, but it's got to be police, there's got to be the right taxonomy, and we can't just let um, the wrong people design the taxonomy. I'm thinking of the fossil fuel industry, or worse, the banks doing it in isolation. It's got to be done fairly. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry if I can't get to all your questions. I do want to do a shout out to two fantastic uh, local community organisations that are here. They were at the entrance when you came in. Zero Emission Sydney North, it's helping people, schools and businesses to get solar, electrify and reach net zero by running information sessions. So please go and check them out on your way out. They've got some inc incredibly good information and know how to get you, your street, your community involved and uh, electrified. Uh, they have their latest project, which is the EV Challenge 100 North Sydney, which is offering new and second-hand EVs for sale and for lease. So we, you can chip away at the problem. And we've also got Solar Alliance here, which is a joint project with Zero Emissions Sydney North and Clean Energy for Eternity. Um, and they're focusing on helping businesses get solar by offering information and independent advice. Uh, they've started in Brookvale for Warringah, but they can help uh, biz more businesses. Um, if I could thank all the volunteers and my team for being here tonight, and in particular Julie, who's put this together. Um, there are always so many more questions, so I will have to organise another session to keep going to make sure we can answer your questions. If I could finish by uh, showing, just giving a shout out that our uh, we've relaunched the Climate Act Now website, so it is calling for a target because I, my experience of government, if we don't set a target, we don't set the drive and the ambition. We need to get uh, social licence around what needs to be achieved. Over the last four years, we've gotten acceptance for net zero by 2050. We need to move the dial on where the next one is. And the most important page I want to get you all to focus on is, well, not only signing up and spreading it on your social media to your friends and family and network, but uh, Luke, if we could just scroll down to uh, the where there are some information to help you. So you, your house household uh, can make a difference. There's a lot of good information there for you to understand how we're placed compared to the rest of the world, what states and other countries are doing. Yeah, I can encourage you all to go and check it out um, and there are actions that you can all take. As Sol has said, we can't just wait for this to happen through other people. We actually have to take the action ourselves. So there is a really good um, information sheet on the five steps you can take in your household and then the five steps you can do with your business or employer and how you really can make a difference. And remembering that one of the number one ways in which you can make... Ah, oh, here we are. We've got... The five things you can do in your home, and a lot of those we've touched on today, but these are some good reminders you can put up um, on your fridge and uh, really think about it. Again, one of the most important ones is your money, your super, uh, and it uh, overlays then, of course, to what employers can do and biz in your workplace because not only can you look at your partners and suppliers, your transport, your energy use and waste processes, but your money, employers, or get the option of saying to their employees, uh, you know, whether you have a default super set up and what your systems are, and it is one of the most effective ways you can make a difference. So I'm sorry if I couldn't get to all your questions tonight. I'm aware it's, it's, it's a weeknight and you've all been incredibly uh, attentive and focused. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Sol, Anna, Tim and Leslie. Um, Uh, so thank you, everyone, and please continue to be climate champions. Uh, get out there and spread the word. And I, I very much believe the glass is always half full, not half empty, and we can do this. <laughs>